so why don't you start off by telling us about yourself? Hello everyone, my name is Saad. I'm a PhD researcher at King's College London. I'm an iCase industrial case student, part of the London Inter disciplinary doctoral program and currently lucky enough to have collaboration collaborations with BASF who my who are my industrial collaborators throughout this PhD project and yeah I have a biomedical science background I'm in a very very fortunate position to be part of the pharmaceutical science uh, department um, and be able to mold and combine my knowledge as well as the pharmaceutical background within this department lovely and it's if it's been a pleasure having you I don't want to say make but I, I suggest that everyone refers to themselves the PhDs refers to themselves as PhD researchers yeah. what do you think about that before we go on to the other points I just I just had that thought as you were talking I think it's a good idea because I guess you have the habit of you thinking that you're a student and you can sometimes limit yourself in your thinking if you always think that you're a student and not a researcher and I think it definitely pushes you more to to be more than just a student you're an active researcher yeah. and I think just by calling yourself a researcher you can you can like it helps you in your confidence as well I think oh good yeah. oh nice that's good to know because as I said I just as you were talking then I realized I've never actually yeah fully asked the opinion because I explained why yeah. I did it and because when I'm yeah. during my own PhD I referred to myself as a PhD student and I was doing yeah. some consultancy work for a company an organization and the person told me off because I'd sent an email and I put in my signature the Hedra Rami Abraham PhD student and he, he was like please don't okay, do that because yeah. in the business world they might be they'll just see students so they might think I'm an undergrad yeah. and then he yeah. was like can you yeah. just change it to put PhD researcher and I was like oh yeah, yeah. so anyway so outside of the PhD what do you do so outside of the PhD, I have quite a few different hobbies. I think one of the main ones has been music production over the past few years. I've been quite, it's just one of the things that I do in my spare time, music production on the side. And I also quite like sports I and mean, I follow quite a few sports, mainly mainly boxing, football, cricket. So that, that's always something that's happening in the background. I, I do enjoy it. And yeah, gaming as well. I, I do like gaming from time to time. But yeah, outside, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I enjoy from outside of the PhD. I'm learning a lot about you. I knew about the music production and it saddens me that till yeah. today you've not presented any of your tracks. And yeah, which games do you play gaming wise? I've never gotten into games. I've always, like, I've always grown up playing FIFA because my brother has the same sort of interests. He enjoys FIFA. So the main thing that I enjoy is just sports based games. So FIFA, UFC, that kind of thing. So what's your PhD about and what problem are you trying to solve? So my PhD is about, it's in, it involves using 3D printing and it combines 3D printing approaches for cell, for cell culture. So in particular, my project involves making 3D printed scaffolds and what these polymer scaffolds can be used for is they can be used in three, for 3D cell culture applications. For example, you can use them to grow, you can use them to grow cells to study, to study the effects of drugs on a particular cell. So you can use these scaffolds to create these structures known as organoids or spheroids. And what you can use the, what they allow you to do is they allow cells to grow in three dimensional space, similar to how it would in the body. And what my PhD is trying to solve is looking, it's, it's basically looking at, it's looking at new polymer combinations and polymer systems that can be used for 3D cell culture applications and trying to understand and produce better materials as well as better 3D as, as well as better 3D cell structures which can be used for disease modeling which is important for which is important for creating new treatments for particular diseases so for example if you wanted to look at if, if for example you had a particular cancer you could create like a disease model using by growing cells on these polymeric scaffolds and then you can use that to study the effect of drugs and then you can see and identify which which drug is most effective that particular cell and organoid so yeah my my phd looks to it's quite broad it's quite broad i'd say it has a lot of potential applications and uses is it we're telling me that as your supervisor <laughs> my phd is a little bit too broad you learn a lot you learn a lot just by the breadth of the phd but it allows me to go from start from a broad place and then narrow in as I go along. That's what I think will happen throughout the PhD. Yeah, definitely. I think it's really interesting to hear you talk about the work and also other end of just, I mean, 
I was listening to you as if I didn't know, as it were. And I think one of the challenges with your PhD is the fact that when you're doing anything to, when you're sort of working in the area of making stuff, right, which is essentially what you're doing, pharmaceutical manufacturing, innovation, looking at tissue yeah. engineering scaffolds and things like that. When you are making things, it is broad. And I think this is one of yeah. the challenges within pharmaceutics. So for those listening, pharmaceutics is essentially the science um, of dosage form design, but then we tend to pivot and with other sectors, so such as biomedical engineering. And I think that is one of the challenges that I've personally faced, which is you can do anything. We could make a scaffold and you can say, oh, we're going to grow some cells on it. But somebody might look yeah. at that and be like, oh, but could you ingest it? Could it be a, a drug delivery system? And I do yeah. think that's one of the challenges in this area. Does that yeah. resonate with what you think as well? Yeah, no, definitely. I think, I think the fact that it's the fact you can always create something and you can not realize what application it could have. Like there's been so many instances where, for example, just talking to other students, seeing what they're doing, seeing how their project is. And then it kind of gives you an idea, wait, wait a minute, I could maybe perhaps like implement some of their ideas into my own project and, and create something for my own, create something different. But yeah, you never know. You can, you always get fresh ideas from different places. Sometimes ideas can come from the weirdest places. I think as a researcher, you need to understand where you sit in yeah. the pathway from literally from bench to clinic. Are you making mm -hmm. things and then saying to everyone, I've, I've made these, what do you think it could yeah. be useful? Or are you yeah. at the other end, which is, oh, I know specifically what I want to do. This is going mm -hmm. to go to this patient. And I think in our group, we do sort of sit along <laughs> the whole of that journey. So I think for me, uh, one of the main reasons for choosing to do a PhD is the chance to contribute to a, a particular area of research. And it's not very often where you get to spend four years on one topic area and really go into detail on it. And I think it's probably one of the only chances you're going to get in your life. Because when you start in a career setting, projects don't go on for four years sometimes. You can have like six month long projects up to a year. So you don't always get to fully go in, get to fully get your teeth into a, a massive topic area. And I think that's one of the, one of the major reasons for wanting to do a PhD. And I also like, I also like the flexibility the PhD gives you. It, it does teach you how to manage your own time and you, how to work around, how to work around everything. And it's, it's different to a career, to like a career in industry, for example, where you may have a set routine, whereas doing a PhD, you, you manage your own time and you can make it work for you however you want it to. I think that's another, that's another benefit of doing a PhD. Nice. And, and also the, yeah, and also the chance to, to travel and go to all these events and conferences and that sort of thing and meet new people and being able to network throughout your PhD. I think that's a very, that's a very important part of the PhD process. Nice. And, and hopefully that's something that can continue back this year, like a, a bit more going to conferences and things like that. So you talked about the positives around the PhD. What don't you, or I guess you can elaborate further on what you do like about the PhD, but maybe things that you don't really like about the PhD. I'd say, um, one of the, one of the, I'd say drawbacks of the PhD is that uh, it can at times for some people be more of a solitary experience, more of a lonely experience for a lot of people, mainly because you the only person who really knows what you're doing, who knows what you're doing and what your project is about is you and your supervisor. But apart from that, not a lot, no one else is likely to really know the ins and outs and the details of your project. So I think that's a potential disadvantage of doing a PhD is you don't always get the, you, you're often the one working on your own project. Whereas, this, for example, industry you could be working as a team on the same. Yeah, I, I think that's something that people, that people can be put off. It's interesting because I often say to people, don't do a PhD if you think it's going to, you're going to do it to validate your perceived intelligence, right? So some people do PhDs thinking, ooh, I'm super intelligent. I'm going to do a PhD so everyone knows and you can call me doctor. But actually that journey is really quite, it's, it's, it is a journey. And as you rightfully said as well, that it's a, it can be a very solo journey, even if you have, you're part of a group or whatever, it's still, everything sort of starts and, and ends with you. Well, so the, the good and exciting news is that you recently passed your upgrade file. Yay. Congratulations. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And that was actually the motivation for saying we'll have this conversation. I didn't do an upgrade viva during my PhD. It was just the straight three years and, and the institute I was in, we didn't offer that. And and I think it's more of a standard thing that every, I think most institutes now, it's like a standard thing to do. 
the upgrade. And I'm not being biased, but you worked extremely, extremely hard. Um, and you've been working extremely hard throughout the PhD, but in particular in the lead up to getting everything done. You worked extremely hard, especially working through COVID. Also because I thought it would be very good. And I think you also agreed with me as well to actually have that conversation and let people hear a little bit more about the upgrade Fiverr process. So could you explain yeah. what the MPhil to PhD upgrade is? Yeah, so essentially what the MPhil to PhD upgrade is, a meeting which you prepare for, usually after your first year of your PhD. And what this meeting involves, it, it gives you the opportunity to present your data and your research that you've conducted throughout the year. It's essentially a way where you're assessed during this process and you can either pass or fail your upgrade. And the way, the way it's assessed is that you prepare a report and you submit the report uh, a couple of weeks in advance and then that gives your committee members a chance to read it and then the next stage of that is preparing for your presentation so when you give a presentation at your upgrade and then usually followed from the presentation it's a discussion on your research and that's that's they that's when they assess whether you've passed or failed your upgrade and whether whether essentially you're able to continue on to the rest of your PhD so yeah that that's essentially what the upgrade is it's a it's a it's an assessment in a way allowing you to pass from one stage of your PhD to the next stage of your PhD amazing so how did it feel when you when you realized or you were told that you'd passed it was a very very relieving feeling being told that especially after you spent months working on a project thinking of this idea and then you equally enough time and effort preparing the report and then preparing the presentation to finally be told that oh well then you've passed it was a very relieving feeling for me and I was very very pleased to have passed and yeah and I couldn't have done this without the help of yourself as my supervisor and that was that was very it was very very oh thank uh, you don't get me emotional <laughs> like oh thank you so much no it was it's been a pleasure it's, it's really good you you really worked amazingly hard so let's talk about that actually your journey to prepare for your upgrade what was that like let's talk about that so it wasn't always a straightforward journey there was a lot of there was a lot of challenges along the way but i think how i prepared for it was firstly by making a, re a plan for my research a plan for all the experiments that i want to conduct and having a set date and timeline for when i want to finish these experiments so when i want to complete my experiments and then when i want to start my writing process for my report but um, yeah the ways i used to prepare was firstly making a plan for myself, a research plan, conducting the research and then allowing myself the time to look at my data and then begin writing a report to summarize my findings. And then the, the last bit is obviously preparing for the presentation and the best way for, pre for preparing that is just by practicing. So that's, that's essentially how I prepared. Yeah, that's really interesting. And did you find, because also in your case, and you mentioned it about preparing the data and all that stuff, but aspects of your data collection was during lockdown. So you obviously had that challenge as well as then following through when getting back into the lab. I do think it's an important thing to talk about because I know a lot of right now people actually, it's not just PhD researchers, everybody just needs some form of motivation and, and I guess understanding of how others have coped about COVID. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was actually, I was actually very happy to resume work during the lockdown period, if I'm honest. So I think by the time I started lab work, we'd already been working from home for such a long time. I was just relieved to finally see civilization that is someone else apart from my family so that was also very very nice i actually really enjoyed going back to the lab during the lockdown period because it was actually quieter than usual so that was the main difference it was very quiet compared to the, how it usually is and that was yeah that was also, that was kind that was weird to see if i'm honest just seeing the lab so quiet but it was definitely nice just to be somewhere during that period of time and i think it actually helped throughout the lockdown period being able to go into the lab yeah i know i was very anxious about people go back into the lab and i was like are you sure and you're like yes because i remember a particular meeting and i was like well we could maybe you're like no no no, i'm, I'm fine I, I could i could go in and yeah, also yeah. seeing in person after so long that was really weird you don't really know what to do it's like hello hi it's just social interaction has been very strange yeah it was um, different you just didn't get a chance you're trying to figure out what everyone's used to like whether you i've had somebody try to high five me and i was like i don't i don't know if, like i don't think you should do that and i like, hi and i'm like nope nope i'm 
just going to keep that's my it. hands down. That's that's <laughs> So, do you think the upgrade is important? I definitely do. I think it's it's, it's a really important. I, I think it's it will be very helpful because I think one. Of, I mean, one of the main things about completing a PhD is passing your viva at the end of the entire PhD, and I think the upgrade can be a really useful way of preparing you for that. So it really does prepare you on how to how to think critically about your own research and how to how to be able to justify the reasons for choosing certain techniques or certain experiments. It really teaches you how to justify and be critical about your own work. And I think that's something that's needed when you want to go on to pass your viva at the end of your PhD. So it's a def it's definitely a good preparation for that. And it also prepares you for dealing with dealing with questions and criticisms about your PhD and that sort of thing. So I think it's definitely a very, very helpful. What advice would you give to, and I'm going to put two groups of people. So what advice would yeah. you give, and this is around the upgrade, what advice would you give yeah. to new research, new PhD researchers? So somebody yeah. just starting their PhD and then yeah. what advice would you give to somebody who is preparing for their upgrade? So maybe start off with the new yeah. PhD. I think some, for someone starting off as a new PhD student, I think one of the, the bit of advice I'd give is just work out what works for you, like in terms of your own working patterns and try and develop some time, like a timetable if that suits you or, or some sort of timeline of what you, some sort of structured working pattern that works well for you and will help you be productive throughout your first year in your PhD and beyond. I think that's first putting on, putting in the foundations to do well is important in the first year. The first step to that is just making sure you have a, a good work pattern for yourself that works well for you basically and being able to know how much how much time you need to rest for example because that's just as important as working um knowing when you need when you need a break knowing when you need to just chill out and yeah i think that was the main bit of advice i give is just be find out what works well for you in terms of your work style work pattern and use it to your advantage and for someone preparing for the upgrade it's a similar sort of thing. Just be able to plan your research well in advance and don't give yourself too much. To, don't get, don't set unrealistic targets for yourself. I think that's a important thing is not to set unrealistic targets. If you, when you're trying to prepare for your upgrade, give yourself enough time and allow yourself to prepare so that you feel confident with your own research and with your own self. And I'd say uh, just when it comes to preparing your report, I'd say just Take your time analyzing the data, analyzing the results, find out what, what, what it means, what story can you tell, that sort of thing is the, probably the most difficult part and I think requires the most amount of time given. And as well as that, just practicing your presentation when it comes to your upgrade, just practice, just give yourself enough time so that you don't stress in, in the situation. And yeah, even preparing for your upgrade, give you give yourself plenty of time to rest and relax and because you can't work 24 seven and be switched on 100% of the time. So you need to be able to also switch off even when you're preparing for your upgrade, I'd say that's the advice.